Thank you, Dr. Richards, for your sincere message and thoughts. Uh, now, please allow me to share with you a few slides about, about you, participants and uh, dear speakers. Uh, the number of participants during this conference uh, attended all of it or part of it, almost 2,000. Uh, as you can see here, 30 per, sorry, 50 percent are fresh graduates or still undergraduates, and about 20, 30 per, 30 percent are from academia, and uh, postgraduate 13 percent. The gender balance is uh, on your side. Well, wait a little bit, wait a little bit. <laughs> speakers. We have 167 speakers, one-fifth from Egypt and the rest from the international uh, world. <laughs> well, well, I know that the applause people are only men, but, <laughs> but wait. Ten years from today, you will be the same ratio as the participant. I'm sure of that. Well, as we, we know that this is the fourth version of the, uh, of the first edition of the conference. We started with only 900, 2004. Now we are almost two and a half times of, of the last time, of the first time, and 50% of the last time. Uh, for the speakers, we started with only 73 speakers. Now we, you are 167. As you know, the rise is okay. We hope we have reached the 200 next time. Uh, speakers are from the, uh, the old continents, from the four corners of the world. We have uh, 105 from developed countries, 44 from developing countries, and 8 from emerging countries. As for the Nobel laureates, the first time we, 2004, we had four Nobel laureates. 2006, we had five, actually, because uh, Jean Marie Lane participated in two and four, 2004 and 2006. Last time, we had only three, but this time, we are having five. So I think we have to be, give a big applause to our Nobel laureates that are coming. This is the third one. Now, no, 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 not this now. Oops, sorry, I'm sorry, not this now. Now, I have really a very difficult task. This task is to introduce someone who really doesn't need an introduction. Because he's a politician among politicians. a senator among senators. Not only that, also a scientist among scientists. A writer among writers. an educator among educators, too. Wait for this. An artist among artists. A prince among princes, too. And, of course, a Liberian among Liberians. Well, dear friends, I could go through and end this list. But let me stop here and ask all of you to join me to welcome the bio-visionary, the one and only I.S. Ismail Sraguddi. Uh, well, 
Well, thank you, Muhammad, for this very unusual introduction. <laughs> I thought he was going to show a few slides about the statistics of the participants, but he kind of threw these at me, and I'm deeply honored. Thank you for having done this. Well, my friends, this is the moment when I am asked by tradition and by necessity to try to bring our proceedings to a close. And I would like to start out by expressing thanks to all, thanks to all the speakers, and especially Rich Roberts who gave this very thoughtful set of remarks at the end on behalf of the speakers. Thanks to all the participants, especially the young, to whom I will have much more to say as I proceed. And thanks to the organizers. But before that, I would like to mention someone who was very special to all of us, and many of you have known that person. She was Alia Ali, who until a few weeks ago was in charge of all the travel arrangements and transport arrangements and booking arrangements for not only this conference but all other conferences. She was a vivacious and uh, indefatigable person who worked around the clock and brought charm and smiling to always get things done. She was the person who never said something was impossible. Everything could be done. We lost her to an aneurysm in the brain in a very sudden way. And uh, I know that she would be proud that the team that she had recruited and trained stepped in and continued all the arrangements for this conference and other ongoing activities without missing a beat. I think she's here, she's proud, and we thank her team led by Umne Ali Tawab on behalf of Alia Ali and on behalf of all of you, a big thanks to our departed friend. I would like on your and on my behalf to thank the organizers. And I'd like to start with the volunteers who have done so much for this conference, for the library, for all our activities, for we could not exist without them. The volunteers are those who are so devoted to the objectives of what we do that they give their time freely and they are always there to help make things happen. I'd like to thank all the staff of the library, all the staff of the Biblioteca Alexandrina, from the secretaries to the security, from the engineering to the environmental landscaping, from the administration to finance to travel, from the IT to interpretation. All of the staff have done remarkable work, but especially the staff of the CSSP Center who have organized this, and I would like to ask them all, Muhammad Faham and colleagues of the CSSP, please stand up. Thank you all for a remarkably smooth operation of a very complex conference in the last four days. And what wonderful days they were. As we reflect on those four days, we started with broad themes from medicine, health, and education, food, agriculture, and natural resources, technology, industry, and the environment. We had many parallel tracks, from membranes to water, from education to food security. 
In each of these, we celebrated heroes, such as the late Norman Borlaug. And we addressed challenges of poverty and inequality, of globalization, justice, challenges of knowledge, and the problems of ethics. We looked at courses of action. We analyzed impact and effectiveness. And in all of these, science was our compass. The rigor, rationality, and neutrality of the scientific method was our guide. But ethics and the sense of innate fairness was there to keep us focused not just on what we think can be done, but also what we should do. We encourage dreams, dreams of better tomorrows, for blessed are the dreamers, without them, humans would still be living in caves. Our distinguished speakers, they are all dreamers. Rich Roberts here dreamed of finding answers to difficult questions when he was a young man, and he continues to this day. And they are also not just dreamers, but they are leaders in their professions, in their fields, in their societies, in the world. And in the sense of that, you have seen in the kind words of all our speakers, especially our last speaker, Dr. Roberts, that leadership, true leadership, is not based on top-down power, but in engaging with others. It brings to mind that wonderful sentence from the great Algerian French writer Albert Camus, who says, don't walk behind me, I may not lead. Don't walk in front of me, I may not follow. Just walk beside me and be my friend. These leaders who walk beside the people who have not lost the common touch, they are also rebels who change the existing order of knowledge and they add it to it. They are young at heart, as I hope that I am. For years may I wrinkle the skin, but to give up our ideals wrinkles the soul. And the years may mark our face, diminish our physical vigor, whiten our hair, or maybe even take it away, limit our eyesight, but we remain young at heart, for you are as young as your faith and as old as your doubt, as young as your dreams and as old as your cynicism, as young as your self-confidence, as old as your fears. You are as young as your hope, and as old as your despair. And you will remain young as long as you believe in the beauty of your dreams, as long as you believe in hope, and only if you give in to pessimism and lose sheer and courage, then, and only then, are you grown old, and then indeed, as Douglas MacArthur said, you just fade away. So, with the vigor of youth, we address challenges, and challenges we have aplenty. For if we have pushed back somewhat the specter of nuclear holocaust, other challenges loom ahead. Globalization, environment, poverty, and hunger. My friends, we, every one of us here, are among the very privileged on this planet. We have 1.2 billion people who live on less than a dollar a day, and twice that who live on less than two dollars a day. And one person in six on this planet does not have access to clean water, and the third have no access to sanitation. And more than a billion people are going hungry. And the marine fisheries of the world are grossly overexploited. The soils are eroding. Water is becoming scarcer, deforestation, desertification, climate change, and biodiversity loss all demand redoubled efforts. While in the 47 least developed countries of the world, 10% of the world's population subsists on less than one half of 1% of the world's income. 
and 40,000 people die from hunger-related causes every day. And a sixth or more of the human family lives a marginalized existence. So therein lies the challenge before us. Will we accept such human degradation as inevitable? Or will we strive to help the less fortunate among the human family? Will we consider that we are no longer responsible for future generations? Or will we try to act as true stewards of the earth? It is not resources that are lacking. It is the will to harness them. Indeed, the world has never been richer, and the future promises even more. Yet, at the start of the millennium in this globalized world, despite the enormous burst of output and productivity, an alarming rise in inequality is noticeable within practically every society. Across the world, the three richest persons have more wealth than the entire GNP of the 48 poorest countries. The 15 richest persons have more wealth than the entire GNP generated by the 600 million people of sub-Saharan Africa, excluding South Africa. The richest 20% of humanity receive more than 85% of the income. Yet, they do not want to allocate 0.7 of 1% of their GNP for assistance to the 80% who receive less than 15% of world income. Incredible wealth is accompanied by a remarkable lack of caring for the weak and the marginalized. Military spending is still 16 times more than development assistance today. We must harness the emerging universal values of our common humanity and see beyond the individual wealth and growth of GNP. And remember, as Robert Kennedy said, that the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate, or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country, it measures everything, in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. And in pursuit of that which makes life worthwhile, I say we must not forget the weak and the vulnerable in this increasingly competitive world. And the ruthless allocative efficiency of the markets must be tempered by a caring and nurturing society. Abraham Lincoln once warned the American people that a house divided cannot stand, that a nation cannot live half slave and half free. And today I say to you and to all people that a world divided cannot survive, that the human family cannot live partly rich and mostly poor, that we must change the world. Do not listen to the cynics and the naysayers. The world can be changed but only if we fight against the prevailing apathy and lack of caring, only if we fight against the currents of obscurantism and fanaticism that would take us the other way. Now, to this fight, this new generation of whom so many are here, whose vanguard you represent, must bring its abilities and a sense of moral outrage. Yes, moral outrage. It is inconceivable that there should be over one billion persons going hungry in a world that can provide for that most basic of all human needs. Now, in the 19th century, some people looked at the condition of slavery and said that it was monstrous and unconscionable, that it must be abolished. And they were known as the abolitionists. 
They did not argue from economic self-interest, but from moral outrage. They did not ask for marginal improvements in the conditions of slaves. They demanded the abolition of slavery. And today the condition of hunger in a world of plenty is equally monstrous and unconscionable and must be abolished. And I say that we, all of us, every one of us, must become the new abolitionists of this new century. For we must, with the same zeal and moral outrage, attack the complacency that would turn a blind eye to this silent holocaust which claims some 40,000 hunger-related deaths every day. And with science, we can indeed heal the sick, feed the hungry, protect the environment, bring dignity to work, create space for the joy of self-expression. With science, ethics, and determination, it is possible. And what is exciting is the search and avenue of science itself is undergoing a profound transformation. In fact, I believe that we are on the cusp of the greatest knowledge revolution the world has ever known since the invention of writing. Now that's a big claim. And I will not get into a lot of details because I have presented this material elsewhere. But I see that it's an exciting time to be alive for this new knowledge revolution we are about to enter that, as I say, is unmatched in its impact since the invention of writing is transforming how we deal with knowledge. And there are seven pillars to this knowledge revolution. First, we have all gotten used whether people wrote on parchment or on papyrus, in scrolls or in codex, to parsing information in certain ways. And from the 17th century, the format has been more or less defined. You have an introductory problem statement, then you explain your methodology, then you marshal your sources and your evidence, you do the analysis, the interpretation from which you draw conclusions, and then there's a variety of means to provide references and other supporting material. That is how we write an essay, that is how we write a journal paper, that is how we write a book. But now things have changed. We have a home page from which we link to other material. There's a fluidity that is coming in that didn't exist before. And it's not just the parsing, the breaking down that is different than it used to be. It enables us to do things we couldn't do before. The Encyclopedia of Life that was presented by this film during the lunch break is such an exercise. All these scientific institutions collaborating, and we are proud to collaborate with them and with other libraries, to create a single web page for every species on Earth and to digitize 300 to 600 million pages of biodiversity literature behind it. And you access it through a central portal. Now that is a new way of presenting scientific information on a scale that would have been unthinkable before. Wikipedia is another example where, in fact, 100,000 people who didn't know each other participate in collaboration to create a new encyclopedia and, in fact, created the biggest encyclopedia on Earth in a matter of five years. But more importantly, not just the parsing and the organization, because we are going to move to the semantic web and its enormous new things, there is something new happening on the knowledge scene that never existed before. When we were dealing with published materials and with books, the text was what I would call dead. In the sense that if you have the same edition of the same book I have and we open page 157, it will be identical. We can close it and then three months or three years later, we reopen page 157, it will be the same. This is no longer true with websites. 
Websites are being constantly updated. What existed before, you have to go back to the Internet Archive, which we have here in the library and in California, to find. So with the semantic web tracking information and relations as well as objects, with this new form of parsing and presentation, with this new living material, you have a texture that allows you to connect between things that is vibrant, alive, and changing in ways that didn't exist before. Not ever since the invention of writing have we confronted the situation where this enormous web connects everything and the knowledge itself is changing every day. Secondly, for the first time, we are not going to rely exclusively and in fact even less on text than we used to. Image is becoming extremely powerful. Whether in PowerPoint slides, like the ones we show in the, in the, in the uh, super course, or generally people taking videos with their uh, uh, mobile phones and putting them on YouTube. But whatever the case is, image is going to play a role next to text in a very powerful way, way beyond anything experienced by our elders, our grandfathers, and certainly for our grandchildren, augmented reality, virtual reality, other forms of imagery and interaction are going to be there. Thirdly, with the exception of pure mathematics and philosophy. Philosophy asking questions like, what is the meaning of life and what is the purpose of the universe? Or pure mathematics, every other field Today, humans will not be able to search for, find, retrieve, manipulate, and add to knowledge except through a machine. This is, again, a new phenomenon. The idea of Einstein sitting there writing equations, seeing into the book of life or Newton is no longer there. It may be good, maybe bad, I think it'll be good, but Again, it's new, it's different. Fourth, complexity and chaos. Our systems have become incredibly complex. We're trying to deal with very, very complex systems, much more complex than anything before, and systems that show chaotic behavior in the scientific sense, which means that they have nonlinear feedback loops in them, and therefore predictability is difficult to do, achieve. And that brings us to the fact that computation and research are going to be extremely central to the new research paradigm. And not that in the old-fashioned way. But in the old-fashioned way, we used to build collections of data. Increasingly, we are trying to build connections between collections of data. And actually, from computational science, we're going to find feedbacks into other areas, including looking at cell biology as an information system, where information is going and how it's being controlled and rerouted and the various parts that play roles in that. Sixth, there is convergence and transformation. Once upon a time, we had chemistry and biology, then we have biochemistry, but we have a lot more exciting things happening at all the interstices of all the overlapping areas of the old tradition, as well as an exploding set of new fields for science that are coming up. I mean, after all, from genomics, we have had now everything from functional genomics and structural genomics and uh, proteomics and metabolomics and all sorts of other areas that would have been unthinkable before. And that brings us to the need for pluridisciplinarity and policy making, where science has become a central part to making policy and not only is there a policy for science, but there should be science for policy. And as Dr. Roberts said, Politicians have to listen more and more to what scientists have to say. And so, it's an exciting time to be alive. Joining in ourselves the legacy of the past and the promise of the future, we confront this great global revolution, the age of information, globalization, and the knowledge-based economy. And will we have the wisdom on how to use it? So yes, my friends, we are entering into a world undergoing a transformation so profound that its contours can only be dimly perceived. 
its driving forces can be barely understood, and its momentous consequences can be hardly imagined. We saw glimpses of that in the program, and Dr. Roberts referred to some of them, from cyborgs and robots to the converging technologies of bio-info nanotechnologies, which I like to refer to as BINT, which is in Arabic means girl, and it stands for bio-info nanotechnology, B-I-N-T. So all of this, for many, provokes fear as much as it seduces the imagination. But driven by ever more powerful computers and ever faster communications, the digital language of bits and bytes is here. It has already allowed us to merge the realms of words, music, image, and data as never before. It has created new industries, and old industries disappear. And with the click of a mouse and the flight of an electron, billions of dollars move across the planet, and the fast eat the slow. And the Internet continues to revolutionize the very meaning of time and space. And that is not all. From informatics to the life sciences, the revolution continues. And as you've heard from Dr. Roberts and from many speakers here, in decoding DNA, the very blueprints of life, we are mobilizing bacteria to do our work, we are manipulating the very building blocks of life. The question is, will all these forces be the forces of homogenization or of opening up to greater diversity? Will they be used to crush the weak or to afford them new opportunities? Our new capacities pose new and profound ethical and safety issues. Unlike the past, our future will be complicated by the enormous challenge of climate change and environmental degradation on a global scale that is impossible to imagine in the past. So in this world so rapidly inventing ourselves, where is our salvation? And here I rejoin Dr. Roberts. It is in the pursuit of knowledge and the quest for wisdom. The former is about science and the values of science. The latter involves ethics and what Lincoln called the call of the better angels of our nature. So science and the scientific method, our compass, our guide. And while science advances with speculation and hypothesis, scientific knowledge is empirical, falsifiable, subject to reinterpretation. And the scientific enterprise is governed by scientific values. Bronowski rightly said, those who claim that science is value neutral confuse the results of science, which is, and the practice of science, which is not. All scientists have a set of values that they must work by. And where these values did not exist, science has forced their appearance in society. The first of these is truth, absolute truth. The worst crime a scientist can commit is to falsify or fabricate data. You are immediately immediately uh, excluded from all the scientific uh, uh, communities. The second is honor. The second worst crime is plagiarism, to take somebody else's work and put your name on it. And we have a whole apparatus that deals with how to give credit where credit is due. And as Dr. Roberts said, other professions if they could even come close to adhering to a fraction of these standards. I'm thinking of politicians, of journalists, of many other professions that are not so concerned with accuracy, attribution, and truth. But science also values creativity and imagination. The imagination, that is what creates those breakthroughs that ultimately lead to uh, recognition and uh, somebody who can say that actually gastritis is uh, uh, not due to stress but to a bacteria <laughs> that really, uh, the Helicobacter pylori, that really changes, of course, everything. So it requires a certain amount of imagination to challenge what exists. But also, and that's very, very important, science is built on a constructive subversiveness. By that I mean 
that science advances by destroying the existing paradigm and replacing it with something new. If the existing paradigms were to remain for all time, there would be no more science. And the fact that, for example, Einstein changes our perceptions of the Newtonian universe doesn't mean that our respect for Newton is diminished. We continue to respect him and we continue to respect Einstein. Now that, because of that, because you don't know where the new idea is going to come from, science requires a tolerance of engagement. That is different from the tolerance of political liberalism. You do your thing, I do my thing. No, tolerance of engagement. Because the idea that comes from this young person may in fact may be the new breakthrough. It may not, but it may well be. And remember that so many of these great scientists have made their contributions at a very young age. At a very young age, and they challenge their elders over that. And with that tolerance of engagement, as Dr. Roberts said, science has a method for arbitration of disputes. There's no such thing as saying, uh, well, you know, it's my view and this is your view. Well, we say, well, let's arbitrate disputes to evidence, evidentiary-based approaches. My friends, I submit that these values are not just necessary to undertake scientific research, but they are important societal values that will create a more humane, more tolerant, more open society. And thus, we should, as we tackle these big challenges that I talked about in this rapidly changing revolutionary world, we should adopt science and the scientific method as our guide and our compass. Our guide. Well, if you visited the National Academy of Science in the United States, under the dome, they have a nice statement written to science, pilot of industry, conqueror of disease, multiplier of the harvest, explorer of the universe, revealer of nature's laws, eternal guide to truth. Well, with more humility today, that was in 1923, with more humility today, we would say, eternal guide to improved understanding. We wouldn't say that there is any eternal, final, and unchanging truth in science, but the quest is the essence. And frequently, it is the fecundity of the questions more than the finality of the answers that counts. So it is exploration, what T.S. Eliot called the ongoing journey. We shall not cease from exploring, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Now for me, I, like Dr. Roberts, also work many, many hours, and my work is my hobby. And I found that this is true of all those who love knowledge and who love the quest. And here's one from a very, very long time ago from China. Confucius said, I'm a man who in the eager pursuit of knowledge forgets his food and in the joy of its attainment forgets his sorrow and who does not perceive that old age is coming on. That is the true scientist. My friends, if we are going to pursue science, we really must reject obscurantism, fanaticism, and xenophobia. Look at the legacy of our great traditions in the Muslim world. First, on seeking knowledge. The Quran, the Holy Quran, is not only full of references enjoining people to look around them and use their brains and, and to think and to observe. And the word ilm and its derivative, knowledge and derivatives, appears more than 880 times in the Quran. But the Holy Prophet said, search for knowledge even in China, indicating to the ends of the earth. And he valued the ink of scholars to match the blood of martyrs. Indeed, it is through the work of the great scientists of the past that the torch of learning and rationality was held high in what Europe calls the Dark Ages. Look at the legacy of our history. Six centuries before Galileo, Descartes, and Bacon, look at what Ibn al-Haytham was saying. 
And in fact, I was stunned because I had picked this quotation and it's almost word for word what Dr. Roberts just said. This is Ibn al-Haytham in the 10th century. 10th century, 1,000 years ago. He who searches for truth is not he who reviews the works of the ancients. It is he who follows argument and evidence, not the statement by an individual who is inevitably affected by context and imperfection. It is the duty of he who reads science books if he wants to learn truth that he should set himself up as an opponent to all he looks at, accepting only what is supported by evidence and argument. 10th century in al shukuk fi Batlamius, Ibn al-Haytham. And on the experimental method, Ibn al-Haytham has a truly amazing perception because he rejected the Aristotelian authority that was prevalent in his day, and he said, we do experiments. We observe, we design experiments, we measure, and we conclude carefully out of that. Listen to this description of the modern scientific method coming from the voice of a Muslim, a great Muslim scientist living in Cairo a thousand years ago. We start by observing reality. We try to select solid, unchanging observations that are not affected by how we measure them. We then proceed by increasing our research and measurement, subjecting premises to criticism and being cautious in drawing conclusions. In all we do, our purpose should be balanced, not arbitrary, the search for truth, not the support of opinions. Now this is as good a description of the modern empirical scientific method as you'd find today. And yet it is from our legacy a thousand years ago. Listen to the powerful voice of Ibn Nafis from the 13th century on accepting the contrarian view. He says, when hearing something unusual, do not preemptively reject it, for that would be folly. The Arabic word is taish, folly. That would be folly. Indeed, horrible things may be true, and familiar and praised things may prove to be lies. Truth is truth unto itself, not because many people say it is. This is Ibn Nafis in Sharh Ma'an al Qanun in the beginning of the 13th century, middle of the 13th century. Actually, Gandhi captured the same thought when he said, an error does not become truth by reason of multiplied propagation, nor does truth become error because nobody sees it. I think the thought is the same. My friends, we have to be open, tolerant, and engage with the contrarian view, accept the views that come if they are supported by evidence. That is our tradition, not what is being bruited around today in rejection of this and that and rejection of that model. Today, we live in a fragile world, and our societies are far from perfect, and our future is clouded and uncertain. For there is violence in our streets, corruption in high offices, aimlessness among our youth, anxiety among our elders, and the virtual despair among many who look beyond material success for the inner meanings of their lives. Can science help? Yes. It is probably the only thing that can help, for quackery and greed have misguided us. And even more, the values of science that I've just discussed must be defended. The fundamental core ethical values we believe in must be upheld, frequently at great peril of unpopularity or more. For we have to stand against those who, motivated by zealotry or bigotry, misunderstanding or mischief, belief or behavior, egotism or fear, whatever their motivations, those who would curtail free expression, free inquiry, and the free flow of information. Those who misrepresent our religious values and our cultural traditions, of which I've just cited many examples. Those who try to deny citizens equality before the law, 
or who would set themselves up as censors to decide what society can see, hear, or read. We must stand up to all of them. And here, to my great surprise, I find myself quoting a person from the extreme right of American politics. But Barry Goldwater probably said it best in 1964 when he said, extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice and moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue. And that is true, and that is where we stand. And so we have to shape the new world, and the secret of success will be as much in your methods and in your commitment to knowledge, but in the bedrock of your values, inherited and learned, and in more than the specific knowledge that you have today. For you have learned to learn, and more importantly, you have grown to care. So harness your skill, your imagination, your determination to create a better world for all, not just for ourselves, but for all. Let us establish a new world where boundaries disappear, where people can reach out and build a community across the political, geographic, and economic divides, celebrating our common humanity and rejoicing in our diversity. A community where each is accepted for their ideas and their ways of expressing them, unaffected by their race, their sex, or the God they choose to worship. Let us protect freedom of expression against those who would curtail it in the name of tradition or culture or religion. Let us demand the free flow of information. Let us defend access to knowledge. For without these, there can be no science, no democracy, no sharing of knowledge. Knowledge is the lifeblood of societies. The constant exchange of it ensures that society lives. Deprived of it, society withers and dies. The flow of knowledge keeps society healthy, the politic vigorous, and allows for solid growth, and above all, ensures that every part of that body is served fully and correctly. But in the exchange of knowledge, in the intercourse with others, whether you are a teacher or a student, whether you are a young or old or young at heart, resolve to be tender with the young, compassionate with the aged, sympathetic with the striving, and tolerant with the weak and the wrong. For, as said Robert Goddard, before you die, sometime in your life, you will have been all of these. So you recognize yourself. And in this changing world, this world of tomorrow, that today's youth will create, that is the world where I, an elder statesman, find myself like Robert Frost saying, now I am old, my teachers are the young. What can't be molded must be cracked and sprung. I strain at lessons fit to start a suture. I go to school, to youth, to learn the future. My young friends, you must create a better world. This theme is one that I take mostly to young people like those who are here. Because in the nobility of your spirit, in the exuberance of your youth, in the quality of the education you have received, in the unsullied idealism that you possess, in the dedication to our common humanity that you bring, I find the hope of mastering the challenges of today and the building of better tomorrows. You will create the new world guided by a vision, a vision of the future of a caring society where in keeping with Gandhi, there would be no politics without principle, no wealth without work, no commerce without morality, no pleasure without conscience, no education without character, no science without humanity. A vision where a people's greatness is measured by the quality of the lives of their poorest citizens and not by the size of their armies or the scale of their buildings. A vision where the future is for all, as open-ended as knowledge, as random as play, as surprising as human imagination and ingenuity. Yes, we must change the world and we must ensure that the new millennium is indeed the millennium for all the wretched of the earth. It can be done, and it must be done, and it will be done by your work. And so, my friends, for the experienced yet young at heart, who shared their wisdom and experience in these sessions, thank you. For the youth who participated 
and infused our sessions with their enthusiasm and their dreams, thank you. And more, for you are the vanguard of that new generation of the coming great global knowledge revolution. So go forth into the journey of your lives and create a better world for yourselves and for others. Think of the unborn, remember the forgotten, give hope to the forlorn, include the excluded, reach out to the unreached, and by your actions from this day onwards, lay the foundations for better tomorrows. Thank you all. Our meeting is adjourned. Please stand up and get closer in the middle and we'll have a picture just where you are. We'll take a collective picture. I will give it to you.